Go ahead and pull it up. The title is called Trust Me, It's Worth the Investment. It's called Trust Me, It's Worth the Investment. I was like, oh man, I hope she pulls it up. Um, I hope it's gonna come up. Like, oh man, if I was on it now, it's on it. I don't know, but I think you're gonna be good this time. So the first thing when you're dealing with making an investment, I put a few facts in here that it's just important for us to take heed to and why it's so important that we make an investment in time in the lives of people that we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. The first thing I put up here is that, and these are interesting facts, so I had a lot, but I said I'm just going to keep it short. One of the first things I came up to when I looked at it was that every day, it don't matter how uh, you got a question already? I didn't even get no, it. No, I'm saying, um, can you put this in the emails? Oh no, this is this is a this was emailed to SBLC last week, so uh, they they going they gonna already have it. I think already sent. Like, hey, what? What do you mean? Like send it out? They always. Yeah, yeah they, they always they gonna eat. They, I got an email. I ain't getting nothing. Hey, there's two people from the exec board here, so uh, you. Oh, well, they, I they, 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 yeah, for yeah, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything is here. SBLC got it last week. So they already got these notes. So there's, there's nothing extra here. They may look at it and say, dude, you put some extra in. No, nah, no, nah, all I did was just stretch the scriptures. That's all, the same stuff. So, but the first thing, every day, 151,600 people die every day. No matter what it is, it could be a natural occurrence or just something. Every day, 151,600 people die every day which comes out to 6,316 people each hour, 105 people each minute, and about two people every second. Every second, two people are dying. Every second, two people are dying. Every second. Now, can you imagine two people every second that you sit here, somebody is dying from something. In 2010, Guns took the lives of 31,076 Americans in homicides, suicides, and unintentional shootings, which equals out to about 85,000 a day, or three deaths an hour. 85 deaths a day, three, more than three an hour. Number three, this one was very interesting to me. I said, I got to put this one. I had like 12, and I said, I got to get my, my fat five. I got to get these five in here. And I said, okay, I'm going to put these five in. Number three, it said 85% of people believe that Jesus walked this earth 2,000 years ago. 6% disagree. 8% aren't even sure, and 1% was indifferent. 85%, that means there are 15% of people walking this earth who really don't even know or even believe or they can't find something to uh, put trust in that the Lord walked this earth. And it shows how, how important the gospel is and taking time to invest in somebody because you never know when somebody's time is up. You may never know <coughs> when that person's next stop may very well be death. Or hell, you never know where people are, and it's so critical that we take time to invest in people. One of the things I was reminded of, and I always remember uh, uh, talk about the school because being a substitute teacher, you never really realize until you actually go through the things, the impact that you can have on the lives of students. And a couple years ago, when I had first stepped into the building, you know, I came in, you know, I, I, I looked kind of young. I had my beard cut. Everything was cut. I still had a little fro because I still had to look like I was older. I didn't want the students to think I was them. And I came in, and they still, they still thought, like, who are you? I said, I'm the sub. Dude, you look like us. I'm like, oh, that's, that's okay. I'm still the sub for today. And, you know, I came in there. And I would give lessons and this and that, and they weren't used to seeing, you know, me because the school was predominantly of white white uh, teachers. About 99.9 percent .9 of it was like more so white, you know, teachers, and about 95 percent black students. So it's like see a black teacher, you know, it was kind of rare for them. So when they saw me, you know, they would come telling me all type of stories. Like, Mister Taylor, let me tell you, this is what happens. I mean, I'll tell me stuff I don't need to know. And then, you know, I, I'm not here, I'm not your counselor, you know, I'm just here to be the sub today. You know, y'all come to me like I'm your savior or something, like, no. And one of the things that I learned, there was a student who was a senior. And, you know, every time I'd see him, he might be talking about nonsense or cussing or doing this and that. But one thing I noticed is that he always watched me. 
He always watched my mannerisms and the way that I would talk or the way I would do things. And one day he came up to me and he asked the question like, so what are you, some type of, some type of religious person or something, or something? What, what, what is it about you? Because you seem like you're not like um, uh, everybody who I may run into. He was like 19 years old. He was a senior. And I said, well, I'm a Christian. I walk with the Lord. I don't do certain things. He's like, oh, okay. Um, and I said, I, uh, I've been walking with the Lord for some time, and I try to do the things that the Lord has called me to do. Matter of fact, we got some videos up on YouTube of uh, the things of Bible studies that we do. And he said, you know what, man? I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to check you out. And I'm going to check those videos out. I was like, all right, cool, cool, cool. I walk by. He ain't about to watch them videos. You know, <laughs> since he be talking about in class, he be talking about silly stuff, man. Grown man, full beard. He look older than me. He looked like he'd be the teacher, not be the student. Now, I'm sitting in the class. Some of the teachers thought I was a student. I'm walking down the hall with my little bag. I said, that's a well a mannered young man. You you know, I wonder who here he is. Like, no, I'm one of the teachers sitting in the lounge with them. Like, who are you? I'm like, I'm a teacher. What do you mean? You know, so, but the next day I came in, and he was like, Mr. Taylor, Mr. Taylor, can I talk to you real quick? I was like, yeah. He was like, yeah, and I was watching some of them videos, man, up on YouTube. I was like, yeah, you was watching them? You was like, really? Yeah, okay. I'm like, I'm like, so you was watching the videos. I, what, what video is you? I'm about to quiz you. I'm gonna find out if you was watching. I know him. I know if you was watching the video. What video was you watching? Oh, I was watching that video of finding your place in God, hearing when God speaks. I was like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Tell me some stuff. And he began to talk about the video. And one of the things he said to me, he said, I don't go to church. I'm not a person who comes to the house of you say God because I feel like I can't understand. The pastor when he when he preached, I just I don't understand pastors. But when I sat there and I watched those videos, I could understand what you were saying, and I, I I got it and I enjoyed it, and it was something that I, that I I want to watch more of it. And I sat back and I thought about that that I took a few seconds to invest in the life of somebody who may never step in foot of a church, but those videos may be the very thing that causes them to turn to the Lord. They may be in that 8% or that 6% that don't even believe that there's a God or don't even believe that Jesus walked this earth. But the fact that I took a few moments that though I'm only a substitute, I might just be there for one day or two days or three days. The fact that the Lord allowed me to come into the door and be an investment in somebody else's life, taking the time to invest in somebody's life that could cause them to be changed forever, is something that was paramount to me. And I said, wow, Lord, you put me here for that reason, to make an investment in somebody else's life. So it, it, it brought me joy, y'all, and I was excited to see that I was able to invest in somebody else. Another fact, 2.7 million children under 18 have a parent in jail or prison. At mid-year, in 2012, jails held some 744,000 524 people. Of that, 645,900, which is 86%, were males, and 98,600 were females. In prisons, a lot of kids growing up without a mother or father or having both parents in the home. And I would constantly in the school, I would constantly have kids who don't have both parents at home. They don't know what it's like to have certain things. So they may misbehave because of this reason or that reason. And they'll begin to expound on why they're doing the things that they do. And one of the last facts that I didn't put up there, but maybe somebody can write it down if you want, is that is every year, 106 thousand people die every year from overdoses, whether it's intentional or it's by accident, which is 290 deaths a day or 12.1 deaths an hour. 12.1 deaths an hour from people who have given up on life because they found no alternative to come out of the things that they're going through. And as people of God, God calls us to make an investment. And as I mentioned before, Jesus was somebody that we're about to get into, and it's awesome. He always took time to invest in people's lives. And the gospel right now, so many people are blinded right now because the God of this world has blinded so many people. Lest their eyes be open and they receive the gospel and they be delivered, but their eyes have been blinded. And we're going to see here how Jesus begins to make an investment in people's lives, and we see why it's so significant to take some time to invest in somebody else. First verse, 
And like I said, I only got a few verses in this, but it's, it's, it's got some great stuff in it. Matthew chapter 15, verse 32, it said, Then Jesus called unto his disciples, or called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they continue with me now for three days and have nothing to eat. So understand in this text, just before this, Jesus had just got done laying hands on people. He was healing them. He was healing people who were blind, who, who uh, couldn't speak, who couldn't walk, who had the withered hand. He was doing all of this stuff, and then he came to the Sea of Galilee, and he went up on a mountain, and he sat down. I'll show, just show you, Jesus was never in a rush, though. He took his time. We can learn a lot from Jesus about always being in a rush to do stuff. He always just takes his time. All right, all right, let me, let me go ahead and have a seat. He, was, he took his time and he sat down on that mountain and he saw the people that had left everything. They left everything. They left houses. They left, they left their clothes hanging up. They didn't worry about them. They left their whole life to follow this Jesus. And Jesus began to see all these people that have been following him for three days. And he said, I have compassion on the monster. That means I have a love for these people because they have made up in their minds that they're willing to follow me for three days and they have nothing to eat. Some of us can't go a day without eating. I don't know if I'd have made it. If I'd have been walking with him for three days, I don't like, Jesus, man, where we go eat, man? I've been walking with you for a minute, Lord. I know you're able to make a way for me to eat. I didn't see you heal somebody, so I know you can bring some food. Cause a hamburger to fall from the sky or something. I know they ain't got burgers back there. Cause a manna to fall or something. Like, I'm hungry. You know what I'm saying? But these people, you don't find in the text that these people are complaining and walking, oh, God, here we go, day three. We walking with Jesus, oh man. There's I'm taking up my cross and I'm walking daily with the Lord. Oh God, I'm hungry. No, you don't find, you don't see nowhere in the text where Jesus is talking about these people complaining about eating. They had such a hunger for the word of God and the fact that somebody would come to them being imperfect people. Seen in the eyes of the Jewish scribes and everybody else as being imperfect people. People who are not worth their time and their effort. But the fact that Jesus would come by and visit them where they were and make an investment in them. Cause them to say, I'm willing to follow this man anywhere because the words that are coming out of his mouth, they're life to me. They're, they're making me to understand that I'm, more, I'm worth more than what somebody else thinks about me. So Jesus says, I have compassion on the because they have continued with me for three days and they have nothing to eat. And I will not send them away fasting lest they faint on the way. So he had an understanding. He understood where the people were. It shows us that no matter where we find ourselves in life, the Lord always knows where we are or the place that we're at. Wherever we may be at the place where we're getting ready to give up or somebody wants to give up, the Lord always knows the place where people are and he has a compassion on the people and he shows it. Even if he's got to send somebody, he'll send somebody to somebody who may be in a place where I feel like I want to give up on this. I, I just feel like I can't make it. And he, he understood where the people were. He said, I can't send them away. Let's stay. They died on the way going back home. They didn't walk for me three days, walk with me for three days already. So I know they're tired. I know they want something to eat. He had an awareness of people. So he said, wait a minute, wait a minute. So in the next verse, he begins, he says, okay, y'all. You know, I'm not going to send these people away. Have everybody sit out. Everybody sit out. There's thousands of people. And the thing I put there, it was over 4,000 people, including women and children. 4,000 people. You know you were anointed when 4,000 people is going to follow you. It's like Forrest Gump when he started running and all those people was running with him. Now, you got to have something on you for all the people to be following. Can you imagine why Cincinnati people just walk, thousands of people just walking? You would think it's some type of march, especially if it was all black folks. Y'all, they marching for something, y'all. Let's just jump in the line. They're marching with, yeah, man. We're going to give equal rights. Like, yeah, ain't nobody in the crowd cheering for that or nothing like that. you just in the crowd with them. But these, can you imagine 4,000 people just walking down Cincinnati in the street, just walking? You see one man ahead of him with a white robe on, and everybody else just following with sandals on, just walking, and everybody else just following him. So they, he tells all the people, have them all sit down. And he asks the disciples, what is their team? What, what do we have? And they say, well, well, we, we, we got, a, we got a, a couple fish and, 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 some, and some loaves. That, that's all we got, Jesus. We ain't got that much. We got a lot of people, Jesus. I don't know how you going to feed all these people. We got a lot. I'm just, I'm, we're going to show you. The disciples, will always, they would always magnify 
the little bit that they have instead of magnifying the Lord. And Jesus, he takes the stuff, and we're going to see what he does. He takes what they said. This is what we have. He says this. He took the seven loaves and the fishes, and he gave thanks, and he broke them, and he gave it to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. So he took that little bit of stuff, and he broke it. And the first thing he did was he gave thanks. Not only did he give thanks for the food, but there's a greater revelation in the text that he gave thanks um, to God because he was showing us the importance of giving thanks for even the little things God does for you. Even if it just looks like a little bit like, God, this don't look like this is going to be enough. Just the fact that you are willing just to give thanks for the little bit that he's giving you. The little bit of time, the, little, the financial aid, the little bit of right mind that you have, the accessibility to, to have the activity of your limbs, just being able to give thanks. People take that for granted every day. They take for granted the things that they may look at as a little thing, but the Lord sees it as a big thing because to somebody who's blind, being able to see is a huge thing. So the Lord, he broke this and he gave thanks. And they took those, those two fishes or a few fishes and seven loaves and they fed uh, 4,000 people. And not only did they feed 4,000 people, they had 12 baskets left over. Now you can imagine all 4,000 people, you know today, it's hard enough trying to get Get people organized in a stadium of thousands. I don't know how Jesus got them people organized. He just said, I right, just tell the people to sit down. Now, you met 12 people trying to get 4,000 people to sit down. Just tell them all to sit down. I can imagine they, they were a little restless, but he, he got them all to sit down, and he gave thanks, and he distributed it. And it shows us that Jesus always sees um, the greatest value in the smallest things. Things that we don't even see. He sees a great value. I brought this movie and this is one of the movies, y'all. I got like mass movies. I always got an illustration. Something that's just paramount. I got to bring it out. I got this movie, y'all. It was on sale. I can tell you how much it was. But I got this movie on sale. And I said, well, I'm going to watch this movie. And this movie, if you've never seen this movie, I brought this movie a lot. One time this summer, man, as soon as I got that teacher Bible study, somebody came up to me right in the Bible study. Praise the Lord. I think I can borrow that movie. You know what I'm saying? They wanted to watch this movie. But this movie is so powerful because it's called The Pen. Now, if you can imagine, every day we walk past pennies, every day we see stuff on the ground, I ain't picking that up, that's not worth no money. But this movie is about a penny, and how one penny affects the lives of six people, and it changes the lives of a couple people in the movie forever. One penny changes the lives of a couple people forever. One penny. Now, can you imagine a penny? That seems as something insignificant. I don't know, a penny. I don't understand how that penny could have had effect. It affected the lives of six people. Not only did it affect the lives of six people, it ultimately saved the lives of some of those people. One penny saved the lives of some of those people. And sometimes we don't see the value in something so small, but we see that the Lord always has a great value. He shows great value in the smallest Thing. Some of the things I put here in the text that he begins to show us is that he shows us in the text the importance of not only fellowship, but the importance of family. The importance of people and having compassion on people and loving people where they are. He, I said there was 4,000 men besides women and children, and he had compassion on them. He saw the importance of loving people where they were and understanding where they are. Sometimes we get so busy in life that sometimes we may not always take time to just sit down with somebody and say, hey, how you doing today? Is everything going okay? Or even taking time being in school. I know it was for me when I was in school, I didn't always have time to call or go back home and visit my family. But you never know what family member may need your touch, may need your call. And you may not see how significant or important it is to make an investment in your family, the time. Because they took an investment raising you in them diapers and all that stuff. Well, you was a stinky boy or girl. You know, I had to always do it. Let me tell you the story. Let me pull out the little book and show you when you was a toddler. Like, I don't want to see that right now. I'm a grown man or woman right now. I don't even see that. But they took time to invest in you. And it's so important that we take time to invest in our family or our little cousin. Just calling somebody up and saying, hey, how you doing today? I just wanted to call you little sis. A little cousin, just to see how you're doing. See how everything's going. Everything going okay in school? That little bit of calling, you may never know what impact 
that may have on someone's life when you take the time to invest in somebody. Jesus shows us the importance of family. And spending time with people. He would go to people's houses healing people, healing people's mothers, their fathers, their kids. And he would ask about how long have they been dealing with this illness? What caused it? He took time to spend with people. And it's something that we should always take time to do. He had compassion on them. Loving people where they are, no matter what they were going through. Just taking time to love them. Time. He had the people sit down and he fed them naturally. <laughs> He dealt with their spiritual needs, but he had an awareness of what they were dealing with naturally. He understood that somebody's stomach is out there growling. They need to eat, so let me go ahead and have everybody sit down so I can feed them what they need right now. Some of the ways that we can do the same thing, like I said, is spending time with people and having a listening ear for people. No matter who it is, while we're walking on campus, I recall, and I told this story to somebody, when I used to work in Gabriel Brothers, I don't know, anybody heard Gabriel Brothers here? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, well, testify. There you go, there you go. I worked there for three and a half years, y'all. I thought the Lord was never going to deliver me out of that time. <laughs> man, I wanted to be delivered. I felt like I was Daniel, man. I'm like, I ain't never about to get delivered. Like, man, I was there for three and a half years, and for two, and my car had got uh, totaled. I got an accident, and for two and a half years, I walked to work, back and forth in the rain, the snow, and the sleep to hell. It was about three to four miles. It was an hour and ten minute walk. I walked from Tri-County Mall to what? Route 4. Every day. Now, now, you can imagine, that was a long walk. Now, and I, now some people would have quit a long time ago. Like, I'm done. After that first walk, I'm done. I quit. You know, it's over. But see, during that time, I was going through a lot. So I'm like, man, I can't find nothing else. I'm just going to have to make this walk, man. And I hated it. Every day, I get out there, like, man, getting up there. And I'm like, oh, Jesus. Oh, the blood. And I had to come up with something to get my mind off that walk. But one of the things that the Lord began to deal with me at when I was making that walk was, I was being a light to somebody who didn't know Jesus. There would be co-workers who would see me walking, and they would stop me, and they would pick me up, and then all out of nowhere, there would be people who would begin to start just, they felt this, 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 this comfort in just telling me about things that was just going on in their life. Like, they just felt comfortable just saying, like, man, I've been going through this and that. I ain't said nothing about Jesus. I ain't said nothing like, hey, we're going to church on Sunday or this and that. Like, hey, y'all know, y'all need to do this. And I never really, some people, some people I did, but others, I didn't just openly just start talking about the Lord unless the Lord opened up a door for me. And there was one particular person, she was a great person, good Christian woman, um, that the Lord allowed her, and you know, I told her one day I might mention you in the Bible study, so you might be watching Bible, watching when the Bible says there you are, and put your own care. But one day, um, she was somebody who invested time in me that she would always pick me up. We worked the same shift, and she would drop me off down there where I so I wouldn't have to walk every day. And I was thankful to the Lord because that walk was heavy, y'all. I was grateful, especially in the wintertime when it's cold and you walking, man. Boy, Jesus. You get the job, and I was in shape. Could nobody hold the camera to me back in that day. Well, I was in better, better shape than the runners out there in Boston. I was in shape. I can tell y'all what right now. But there would be times when we would just sit in the car for an hour, hour and a half. And she would just begin to just start open up her heart and start telling me things that was going on in her life and things that was going on in the marriage and how she was being treated and certain things that she just felt comfortable just sharing with me. And constantly, day in and day out, when she would drop me up, I would sit there. And, you know, at first, I began to wonder, I'm like, I wonder why she's telling me this stuff, man. I mean, you know, we just got off work, and, I, you know, I'm ready to go home. You know what I'm saying? I'm ready. You know, I got to be up in about six hours, you know what I'm saying? Man, I got to that walk again tomorrow. Right? <laughs> <laughs> like, so I'm thinking about that walk. I'm thinking about this conversation, right? I'm thinking about, I need to go eat. I need to go take a shower, man. It's been a long day. I'm hot, sweating. You know what I'm saying? My show probably on right now. I'm ready to go. But she would begin to pour out things to me. And at the end of it, towards the time where I was getting ready to leave, she began to let me know that, um, you know, I thank the Lord that, you know, you had a listening ear to hear the things uh, that I was going through because I felt like it was such a burden on me that if I didn't get rid of it, uh, who knows what, uh, what would have happened to me. But the fact that you took time out to just sit there and listen to me 
and give me sound wisdom. Even though I'm a young man, she's an older woman, she's probably in her 40s, 50s. You know, I'm young, you know, I'm 28, you know what I'm saying, I'm young. You know what I'm saying? But the fact that I would take time to invest in her, that made a difference in her life that she would never, ever forget. Even her daughter, who she would tell me about all these stories about stuff that she was doing, but my things that I did, it was a light even to her. It was a witness to her. So it shows us that we never know whose life we may be impacting when we take time, sorry, when we take time to invest in people. I heard something that came out on the house. But uh, the camera can see it. Everybody can see it. But uh, when we take time to invest in people's lives. And another thing, gratitude, a quote that I found, this is a very paramount quote. Gratitude is the timid wealth of those who have nothing. Now think about that for a moment. Gratitude is the tenant wealth of those who have nothing. Emily Dickinson came up with that quote, and I said, what is this? this? I don't understand this quote. But then when I began to think about it, when you think about gratitude, it's thanks. It's giving thanks for certain things. And the reason why it says that it's a timid wealth is because timid represents it's a very shy or it's a very fearful thing because sometimes there are people who may not have anything to give you for the time or the things that you've done for them except for a thank you. Thank you for taking the time to listen to me. Thank you for taking the time for praying for me. Thank you for the time of sharing the gospel with me. Thank you for calling me. I love you. I love you too. Taking the time, giving me a hug, crying with me, being there for me. Gratitude may be the only wealth that they have because they don't have nothing else. And when people, the world has a way of trying to belittle gratitude because they're looking like, no, you owe me. You're going to pay me back this, you're going to pay me back that. I'm looking for stuff. The world doesn't look at gratitude sometimes. They don't look at how, how powerful that, how that's a wealth to somebody who doesn't have anything. They may not have anything. And a couple other examples I put there is about, um, I learned this in theology school about a high school kid. I never forget this in theology school. I was getting ready to graduate. Um, someone got a story, true story, about a high school kid who was being bullied. I just told y'all the story about the other kid who was being bullied, and he killed himself. This was a kid in high school, he was a freshman, and he kept being bullied, kept being bullied. He was a nerd. He got straight A's, he got all these good grades, but he kept being bullied. And they would bully him and mess with him time and time again to where he got so fed up with it that on one Friday, he decided that he's going to go home and kill himself. He cleared out all his books out of his locker, and he said, I'm getting ready, I'm going to go home, I'm going to kill myself. Now, all the people was making fun of him, taking all your books, you're going home, nerd, to go study, and do all this stuff. And they was making fun of him, not realizing that this man is getting ready to go home and kill himself. And he's walking home down the street to going home to, uh, with all his books, and somebody walks by, and they knock all his books out of his hand, and they're like, ah, nerd, and messing with him. And it was just another punch, just another reason why I don't really belong here, and I need to just go ahead and end it all. And as he's picking up his books, one of the popular kids who was a freshman, he was, you know, he was, he had everything. He was sports, he had all the girls, he had everything. He was a freshman, just like this young man. And he was watching from afar, and he ran over. And he helped the young man pick up his books. And he walks home with him, and he talks with him. And they go home, and they end up becoming good friends. And he doesn't kill himself that night. And over the years and years and years, their senior year comes, and that young man becomes the valedictorian of the class, the nerd. And he gets up and he has to give the speech, and he gets up and he begins to talk about that, I really shouldn't be here today. Four years ago, I had been going through so much bullying and so much people messing with me that I really was just getting ready to give up on life. And I cleared out my locker and I was getting ready to go home and kill myself. But this person right here, who, who probably would have been a valedictorian, but you know, I don't know why this person was chosen, but that doesn't matter the story. But uh, he said, this person took the time to come over to me, and they spent time with me, and they're the reason why I'm here today. Because if it wasn't for them taking that time with me, and investing and letting me know that I'm somebody, I don't have to be what other people have said about me. That person invested the time in me, and I just want to say thank you for investing this time in me. And everybody, you know all the girls was in there crying, and people was emotional, everybody was in there crying. And he walked over to the dude, and they hugged him. He said, dude, I never even knew that you was going to kill yourself. I said, I know. I wasn't going to tell anybody. I wasn't, because it felt like there was nobody he could talk to. But that young man took the time to invest in him. He invested time in that young man. And, um, and he saw how important it was to invest in him. 
the taking time, trust me, it's worth the investment because you never know who may be impacted by that investment. So that's Jesus. That's the first one. Now on to the next scripture. There's only a little bit left, y'all. This is good. Um, John 15, verse 16. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. So the first thing, Jesus, here it is again, Jesus. He's making an impact. He's letting his disciples know, first of all, you didn't choose me, but I chose you. You were off doing your own thing. You were living life not knowing that you're on that slow train that's on its way to hell. But I came by and I thought enough of you. I was willing to make an investment in you. Then I came and I chose you. And I called you from where you were. Out of the midst of everything that you were doing, I still chose you because I saw something in you that other people might not have saw because I, saw, I wanted to make an investment in your life. That whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Again, Jesus always saw the value of people. He saw that they had value to them. There were so many people sometimes who they have so much negativity that comes their way. It's like, what's the point? All I have, I, I, I hate negative people. You know, I, mean, I don't hate them. But I don't like when negative people come around like, yeah, I man, how you doing? Praise the Lord. Yeah, I'm, I'm, going, I'm doing all right, man. I've been going through. You know what I'm saying? Every time I see them, it's something bad going on. Never, they never got the victory. They're always under the they're always under the devil. They never, the devil's never under them, and he's always on them. You know what I'm saying? Pray for me. You know what I mean? I had somebody one time call me. Like, it was tripping. Like, I don't know how they got my number. They was like, and I found out one of the saints gave them my number. They was like, is this brother Antoine? I was like, they were talking just like this. Like, yeah, this is him. Hey, man, I just want to talk to you, man. Man, I've been going through, man. The devil just been on my back, man. He's been, been, been on my back, man. I was just like, okay, uh... I'm gonna keep you. I'm like, who is this? Like, like I, I had to get my thoughts together. Like, who is this? Like, dude, like, I, yeah, I got your number from Brother Antonio. He was like, hey, man, did the devil ever be on your back? Like, it's just like, like yeah. And then it was, and then every so often it would be this girl who would just say something. It was just something like, yeah. Or it would be some random on the phone. And I'm like, what is, who is that in the background? Like, it was, it was like, it was two people on the call. Like, what is going on? Then I found out it was, it, it was like a three-way call. And I, just, I thought it was just me and them. And then this girl was on the line. And I'm like, what, what's going on? How did they get my number? And then I had to have a talk with that saint. Like, man, why did you give them my number? Man? And I was like, uh-uh. It was like, man, they, they, they were just talking crazy, man. I just figured, man, maybe you could just minister to them. I was like, next time you give somebody my number, Give me, let me know, so I can be prayed up and ready for whoever I'm dealing with. So I ain't just just thrown to the side. Cause they, it was like it felt like it was negative. Like man, that was just always on my back. They didn't have no joy. It was just all negative. Had, everything they had to say was negative. And sometimes the devil will do that to people. Will keep them in a place where they're constantly at a place where they feel like they want to give up and it's just it's not worth it. I put their example in my friend's paper. A friend of mine who went here to UC, um, she was in her senior year, we were both getting ready to graduate. She was all excited. She had a major and a minor, and she found out, she called me one day, and she was crying out, y'all, I just got saved. It had been about seven, eight months. And she called me up, and she, she was crying. She was just crying on the phone. She said, it's over, I'm ready to end my life. It's over, it's done, and this and that. I was just like, whoa, oh, call me, I'm calling tell me, tell me what happened. My teacher said that I plagiarized my final paper. And she's going to not only fail me, but she's going to give me an F. And she's going to have my degree taken from me. Now, at this time, I had just been telling this girl about the Lord. And she was just starting to gradually come to the Lord. And the Lord had put her in my life so I could make an investment in her. Because she didn't know the Lord. And she had gotten hit by the enemy. And she was ready to give up. Because she had so many instances where she was ready to just give up instantly. And just throw on the towel and kill herself. And she was crying and just ready to throw on the towel. And now, mind y'all, I just got saved. So, y'all, I had that moving the mountain and throwing it into the sea type thing. So, while she was crying, she was crying for a good two minutes. I set the phone down because I saw, because I always saw the bigger picture of things. Because my faith at that time was so great. I set the phone down and I was in my apartment. I took our run. I'm like, man, I'm I was praising God because I said, man, God is about to get the glory in this. Like, I see God moving. And I was running in my room, my, my apartment for like two or three minutes. And I thought, like, oh, let me get the phone. Let me get the phone. Let me calm down. I, I know God about to get the glory. Let me get, let me get my shit together. Be real right, right words. And I said, okay, calm down. Come on. Calm down. Talk to, talk to your professor. No, no, no. That's over. No, no. 
talk to the professor. No, I'm it's all talk to the professor. And when you get done talking to the professor, call me back and let me know what the Lord has done for you. And I want you to call me back because God is going to work this out for you. And a week later, she calls me up, and, and she's sounding a little bit better. And she says, well, the teacher said I didn't plagiarize the whole paper. I plagiarized part of the paper. Then eventually the teacher said, well, you plagiarized a page. So it was, it was a paragraph. Then it was a line. Then it found out she didn't plagiarize the paper at all. Wow. And I'm like, like, I'm like, really? And then what happened is she said, the teacher had told her, well, you only plagiarized a couple lines. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and give you a zero for the paper. And what you're going to do is um, take the class again in the summer. And if you pass, I'll make sure everything's reinstated. And she, she, she was content at that level where she was like, yeah, I, I'll take that. And I'm okay. But I said, no, the devil is a lie. The devil falsely accused you, and he's going to restore back to you everything he tried to take from you. And I want you to call me back when she gives you back everything that you deserve. You don't have to take that class again. The devil is a liar. You will not take that class again. Call me back. When God is restoring everything back to you. And a week later, and it is in weeks, y'all, a week later, I had been praying for the girl. I've been interceding for the girl. A week later, I got the call back, and there was some joy in the background. And she said, not only, like I said, not only did she not plagiarize the paper altogether, but the teacher apologized, had her major and minor reinstated, and told the girl that if you ever need me to write a recommendation for whatever you need, whatever graduate program you need to get into, I will write that recommendation. And it was tears of joy. And she said, I don't know how God worked this out, but I said, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he has done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah. You was doubting, but I saw God all the way in the midst of the situation. He was using this as a way to build you up and to let you know that it's not over till he says it over. And I took the time to invest in her life, and it was something that had changed her forever, making an investment in somebody else's life. Chosen. Jesus says always, he always makes an investment in us despite our environment and the things around us. He always takes time to make an investment in me because he sees something. Even in imperfect people, people that even the Pharisees and Sadducees back in the day, they would always see flaws in people and they would always find excuses why not to minister or to do things for people that God had chosen specifically to do for the poor and those who were without. But Jesus made such an impact and he has such an investment in us that imperfect people is what he was after. People that he saw in the midst of whatever everybody else had to say, he saw a fruit of greatness. He saw success. He saw a warrior. He saw a champion in you. And he said, this person is of such a high value that I'm willing to invest in them. And I'm willing to lay down my life in them because I see something in them that's great. And I'm going to make this investment in them. John chapter 17. We only got a couple more verses and we are, we are out of here. John 17, verse 9. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Their word. Now Jesus says, first of all, this is when Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross. And he's praying for his disciples. He said, I pray not for the world. Because the world is going to be the world. The world's going to do what it's going to do. It's going to do its dirt, and it's going it's to let, let it all hang out. The world will always be the world. It's going to do its thing. But he said, I don't pray for the world. But I pray... For them, hold on, hold on, okay, there we go, all right. I pray for, for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine, they are yours. And then look at this, he said, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. I'm praying for those people that thousands of years ago who will believe, those who are sitting here right now, I'm praying for those who will believe the word that's spoken through them, who will have a faith to trust and believe the word that has been spoken by them. It shows us the power of prayer and that prayer still works. It doesn't matter what happens in your life, prayer still works. The word of God has power. The word of God works. The word of God will never fail. When the word of God goes into a situation, it turns any and every situation around. If you have the faith to believe, God is able to turn it around. 
And it shows us the importance of covering people. Jesus said, I don't pray for just for the world. I pray for those disciples, the ones that you have given me, for they are yours. And I pray for those who will believe on this word. And it shows us the importance of covering each other and praying for each other. That time that you invest praying for somebody because you never know what somebody is going through. Covering people and watching out for, pe for people and not letting things just be exposed and taking pleasure in it. I put up there Noah's sons. Noah's sons, Noah got drunk one day and he got he was passed out there and he was naked. And one of his sons came in and saw him naked. But his own son came in and was laughing when I told him, I look at my dad in there, he's naked. And he was making fun. And instead of covering his father, he took joy in the nakedness of his father. Not realizing that we, we shouldn't be taking pleasure in what somebody else is dealing with. But we should have a heart to say, I love you enough that I'm going to cover you. I'm not because I love you enough. You're my brother. You're my sister. You're my mother. You're my father. I love you. And if I love you, I'll cover you. I ain't going to throw you under the bus and make fun of you. But his other two sons came in. They walked backwards with a towel, and they covered their father. They didn't even look at his nakedness. They came in, and they covered their, their, their father, showing them how important it is to cover people and look out for people. And that's what Jesus did. Acts, um, hold on, where am I at? Oh, okay. Another thing I put here, I'm going to come back to that. Acts 1a shows us, it says that you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me. It shows us the power of influence. We are witnesses of what the Lord can do. We are witnesses of what the Lord is able to do. The other thing I put in there is suicide. I had a friend here a few years ago when we had just got out of Bible study, and I'm feeling good, you know what I'm saying? There's some students in here that had a meal plan. They're getting ready to go over here to the, the, the cab, and it's about 10 o'clock, so I was like, yeah, y'all going to swipe me in? They said, y'all brothers and sisters the Lord. So, you know, take care of your brother's needs. So, you know, we went on over there, and they swiped me in in Jesus' name, and I came on in there, we got some food. Somebody sent me a text message. They, they thought, you know, that, you know, they got the wrong number, and they said some stuff, I didn't tell you what they said. But, uh, I'm like, no, this ain't such and such, like, and, uh, that, this, I said, this is such and such, you know. And they was like, okay, and they had sent me a text message about something about committing suicide. And I hadn't even read the text yet, I was just sitting there enjoying the food, sitting there conversating, and fellowshipping with my brothers and sisters from Bible study, feeling good. And I'm on my way home, it's about 12, 1 o'clock, I was just chilling, like, you know, so I, was in, I was in grad school, so it was like, you know, classes were at different times, so it was more chill. You know, I was working at Gage during this time. So, um, but I got home, and I actually opened up the text. It's like the Holy Spirit just led me to open up the text. It's like 12, 1 o'clock in the morning. And I looked at the text, and the person was like, I've been going through so much right now that I really want to commit suicide. And I just wanted to know, do you got time to talk right now? And I, I went, oh, oh, Jesus, let me, let me go. Oh, started calling him right then. I didn't even know this was like four hours ago. I'm like, I hope they ain't, hope they ain't dead, Lord. Let me go jump in the car, go raise them back up. I had to pull a pole on them. I had faith back then. I raised them back up, and I'll be telling y'all another testimony. It raised somebody up on the dead. But uh, I called that person up, and they was uh, crying. And they, they, uh, they said they feel like committing suicide because they had a twin brother that had just died. And they were so close to their twin brother that they felt like they really couldn't go on. And they didn't really have anybody else that was close to them. That, 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 that could console them at this time. And they just said, I felt like there was no way out. And I really want to give up. And right then, I went in in the Holy Ghost right then. And I started praying for them in the name of Jesus. I started rebuking that spirit of suicide. I started casting it away. I'm like, devil, you are a liar. This person shall not die, but they shall live and declare the works of the Lord. They shall live and not die. I command it. I declare it over their life. They shall be a kingdom builder. And I began to just restore that person because they needed somebody who would take time to invest in them and not give up on them. And that person is still alive today. They are one of the uh, leaders over at Xavier's Gospel Choir. They're the, the uh, choir director at their church. They lead praise and worship. They were one of the leaders of praise and worship at Xavier. They're on all different type of boards. So the enemy was trying to kill them and their influence that they've had on people's lives. But I began to come in and cover them so that the enemy would not steal from them the purpose that God had called for them to do. It shows you the power of influence and the power that when you invest in somebody, it can change somebody else's life. Luke 22, we coming down, these are the last couple of scriptures and we're going to get up out of here. Luke 22, another uh, uh, text where Jesus is coming down to the end where he's getting ready to go to the cross. He's getting ready to go to the cross and it shows us that the Lord knows everything. 
It's nothing that we can hide from the Lord. He's always watching. He's always mindful. And he loves us enough to tell us the truth about ourselves. And he says unto Peter, and Kevin said this last week, because that showed me that the Lord confirmed that this was the word for this week. When Kevin said this scripture right here, this was already in the text. I had this ready a minute ago. But Kevin mentioned this. I said, Lord, that's the confirmation. Thank you that this is what I'm teaching today. And it said, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan have desired to have you. So the first thing the Lord says is Simon, Simon. So you notice that sometimes the Lord would say Peter, and sometimes he would say Simon. So anytime you find that, just like the Lord sometimes would call the children of Israel, he would call them Israel, and sometimes he would call them Jacob. The reason why he would do that is that when they were walking with the Lord and they were doing the things of God, he called them Israel. They represented him. But when they were deceitful and they would try to do underhanded things and they would go after false gods and do things that he told them don't do, he would call them Jacob. So here, he calls them Simon, Simon. So it represents his, his other nature, this fleshly part that always wants to rise up, this part of you that wants to dominate you and not allow the Lord to have his way in your life. He says, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you. He wants to take your influence and he wants to destroy you. He desires it because Jesus was aware of what was going on. Peter, Satan desires to have you, that he may sift you as wheat, meaning where he can scatter you, to remove your faith through the trials of life. He wants to remove your, remove you totally to where the trials and things that are getting ready to come in your life destroy you. But look what the Lord says. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. I have prayed for you. The enemy has a hit out on you, but I've taken time to pray for you and stand in the gap for you. If nobody else stands in the gap for you, I'm willing to stand in the gap for you because I'm a true friend. I don't no longer call you servants, but I call you friends because I lay down my life. I tell you what my will is for your life because I'm your friend. Friend. That's what a friend does. A friend will tell you the truth. Even though you may not want to hear, a friend will tell you the truth. He said, I'll pray for you that your faith doesn't fail. Because a temptation, something's going to come down your way. And I pray that your faith doesn't fail. And when you are converted, when you are brought out of what you go through, go and uh, strengthen your brethren. That's why one thing that they mention here is they talk about the accountability partners. The accountability part is something that's so important and influential. Having somebody to pray with you, talk with you, if you're going through something, somebody who can encourage you. That's why he said when you are converted, go and strengthen somebody else. Give somebody else a testimony that the Lord is able to deliver. He's able to make a way out of no way. Where I'm standing here today, I wasn't always just standing here. I can remember the first day that I walked into this Bible study. I didn't even know anything about student body of Christ. I used to go out to the parties and all this stuff, and I used to enjoy myself because I didn't come to this Bible study until 2005. So from 2003 to 2005, I was just partying. Never heard about this. And one day, a friend of mine, Damien, he, we was going to a men's Bible study, just a few of us. And we was going to the Bible study, and one day, for some reason, which I know it was the Lord, it got canceled. It was at 7.30, from 7.30 to 8. And one day, we sat there until about 7.50, close to 8 o'clock. And I, he said, well, I guess the minister's not coming today. And I said, yeah, man, I was just looking forward to it. Because I started to have a hunger for God. I was going to these parties, and I was going to all this other stuff, but I started getting tired of that. And I wanted something more. And he said, well, I'm getting ready to go to SBOC. I said, what's SBOC? And he said, what's this other Bible study? This guy he teaches, he's really funny, man. You ought to come out. And I said, oh, okay. You know, so I trust you, so I'm going to come to the Bible study. And I came into the Bible study, and I sat down. And after that first day, I said, man, I'm about to come to this Bible study. Like, this is what I needed. Even though I, I wasn't saved yet, y'all, I still had some tendencies. I ain't going to lie. I'm going to tell the truth because people need to hear the truth sometimes. I still went out that weekend. I went to some of the parties. I was out there. Dancing at the, the white parties and the black parties. I was in there with the different type of organizations and different type of fraternities. I was in there with the Sigmas when they was making the juice and they had the little masks. I was in there because I had the friends. I was working with all the different groups, so I was there. I was talking to this group and that group, trying to decide which group am I going to be in. Am I going to be in this one or this one? My dad is this, so I may do this. So I don't know. I'm thinking about it now. I got my, I got my fresh braids, so, you know, I'm fresh right now. I had the braids. I had the necklace. I was fresh. So I, might, I might go this way. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm thinking about it. I don't know. But while I was in the midst of that nonsense and 
doing things that were not of the Lord, the difference up between me before coming to the Bible, before the Bible study and after Bible study was that when I was in the midst of that, I, something started to deal with me like, man, I'm better than this. Not to say I'm better than other people, but the fact that I'm better than this, I can get the best of this. And week after week after I kept coming to Bible study, kept coming to Bible study, it came to a point where I'm like, man, I don't want to go to that stuff anymore. I want to do things for the Lord. And when I came into the Bible study, I knew a couple of the people who were RAs or this and that, and I didn't know that much about the Bible. I knew a couple of scriptures, but I said, I came to them. Did nobody have to come get me for Bible study? I was at Bible study every Thursday. I was bringing people to Bible study. No, because I had such a desire for the Lord, and I came to the example, and I said, is there anything that you need me to do? I'll do whatever y'all need in the Bible study. Y'all need somebody to pass out flyers, I'll pass out flyers. If you need somebody to stand at the door and greet people, like, hey, how you doing? Welcome to the Bible study. I'm just happy to see you. If you need somebody, even if you need me to stay after Bible study and pick up the paper in the plastic that people have left in the Bible study, I'll stay after and pick that paper up in plastic, and, and while I'm doing it, I'll give God the glory. Because when I think of where I was and the things that I was doing and where I could have been, I could have been in my grave somewhere seeing people who were being who were being in fights and people getting stabbed and beat up and all this type of stuff. But the fact that the Lord had mercy on me enough to allow me to come in here, I just want to give my gratitude and just tell him thank you. And whatever way I can tell him thank you, I'll do whatever he wants me to do, and I just started getting involved in everything, doing whatever they wanted me to do. We were pass up our passing off life, taking down chairs at the revival, got to church, said, what, what can I do in the church? Then they started talking about the city gospel mission. They've been going down, passing off food for 10 years down at the city gospel to people who don't have food and they're homeless. And I said, we need some volunteers. And all the college, a lot of college students were there. Like, we going, hey, we going down. We going down on Friday. So we got in that line, passing off over 100 people standing there, don't have food. And we sit there, we serve, and they got some grains and some yams and some macaroni and cheese. Them old folks at the church can cook. Grandma cooking in there, boy, and the dad and papa. They cook some, that's that grown, that grown man and woman food. And those people came through that line, they, was, they made sure they made their way to the city gospel because that food that they be cooking to be on point. And they would come through the line, and I'm standing there serving the people. And it's like, you know what I'm saying? They said, thank you for this. I thank you, God. Thank you for taking time to serve me. And y'all coming down here. And then when I go out to the crowd and start talking to people about Jesus. You know, just, just having an opportunity to minister to people. I still didn't know that much about the Bible, but I just had a hunger and a desire for the Word of God. And I was on the campus on fire for Jesus. Like, people used to make fun of me. It was terrible, y'all. They used to call me the Christian police. Like, it was terrible. Like, man, saints used to, people used to hate to see me coming. Like, people will go the other way. Like, people could be ducked off. You know, you know how you get them smokers that's out there, they be freezing cold. And they out there, they over in a corner somewhere shivering, and they just smoking. But they got to get that smoke in. There will be people on places on campus that you would not think that nobody would find them. But somebody will be somewhere getting blazed. And they've been sitting in the eyes just a blank. And then I, here I come coming around the corner or something. And they, 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 I could be about 30 feet away. And they just begin letting like, oh, Jesus. Hey, now come out, come out, man. Come out, man. Like, hurry up, hurry up. And he come. Give me a spray. Give me a spray. Give me a spray. And this spray is not just unnecessary spray. Like, everywhere. And then there I come. Like, you know, I'm coming up feeling good. Got a smile on my face. Hey, like, what's going on? Girl, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hey, pray, <coughs> praise the Lord. Well, praise the Lord. How you doing? Hey, man, I'm doing good, man. I'm just. On my way to this class, on my way to this, man, I just want to stop and encourage you, man. Make sure, man, to be encouraged, man. I just want to say, hey, man, I'll catch you later, man. Be encouraged. And just know God is able, man. He's able to deliver from cigarettes and uh, smoking and all that stuff. And I'm walking away. It's like, man, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, just happy that I can invest in somebody. And, you know, and they act like, see, man, I told you you should have brought the other spray. Man, he just smelled us, not realizing that it wasn't uh, something that I, I picked up. It wasn't something I smelled. It's that the Lord understood. He knew uh, where all of us are. He's always mindful of the things that we're doing. And he loves us enough that he'll send somebody to give us a word or say something that we may not think ain't nobody watching. But there's always somebody that's paying attention. So I would always, I would always be in those places that people would not expect. There would be people that just like where I was when I first came to Bible study, when I would still be going out to cars and doing certain things. I had not totally gave them my, given my life to the Lord. And there would be people, they're getting ready to go out. Girls just came for the salon. 
that's got their nails done, hair done, and you know, the hair is so fresh, you can probably still see the fumes coming from the hair. Oh. They fresh, blowing on the nails, they fresh, got a new outfit, they walking down, they walking, they getting ready to go around. And another one in them corners, y'all. Cars right over here, coming around the corner, smiling and everything. What happens later, you know, it's on a Friday. What happens, I'm coming around the corner, hey, praise the Lord. You know, hey, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And you know, I said, like, we're going out, what y'all up to, man? Uh, you know, nothing, you know, we just, you know, get ready to, you know, hang out. With this. Oh, for real? Man, make it, you know, I just want to let y'all know, man, you know, man, God is just so good. You know what I mean? You know, you know, you know, you know he's just so good. Hey, y'all, y'all, y'all got time for me to tell y'all? Can I tell y'all a story about something real quick? And then you can see the expression, you know, I may see the expression on my face, oh, God. You know, it's bad enough we didn't see this man. Now he's about to start preaching to us. Like, oh, God. You know, and they standing there, and then I start telling them the story. Y'all know the story I told them. They were getting ready to go out somewhere to a party. Y'all know the story I told them. Y'all heard the story. But that July story, I said, man, it was a story. I said, I tell you, what's crazy, man? About this girl, man, she used to just, she used to go out to these parties. She'd go to the club, then she would go to church on Sunday, then she would repent. And then she would go to the parties and the clubs, and then she would go to church on Sunday, then repent. And then one day she just got tired of doing it and just gave her life to the Lord, told her friends, I'm not going out, I'm not doing that stuff anymore. I serve the Lord for real this time. I'm not doing that stuff anymore. And she really gave her life to the Lord. And months went by and all these weeks and all this stuff. And time will wear on you if you don't make if you don't make an investment in the things God has given you, like in reading your word, praying, fasting, and hanging out with the with Christians and doing godly things, things that edify. Like we go bowling, skating, we, we find other things to do. We fellowship, we have movie nights. You know, we do other things. And she allowed time to get the best of her. And her friends would call her up and she said, you know, okay, you know, I'll go out this one night and, you know, just enjoy myself, you know, um, it's just one night. Not knowing that on that night the Lord will require her life. And she went out that night going out to the club thinking, like, I'm just going out just to enjoy myself just for a little bit. And they're dancing, having a good time. Somebody comes by the club who doesn't like somebody else in the club. So they, they put down the window and they start opening fire in the club. They're just opening fire with multiple shots. And you know everybody's ducking and dodging. Ain't nobody trying to get hit. I know I wouldn't have been trying to get hit. I'm small, too. So I can, I can squeeze in the corners and not get hit. But uh, there's a bullet with your name on it. It's got, so it's going to be with your name on it. And two of the shots that went through the crowd of uh, oh, all dozens of people, two of the shots went through the crowd and hit the girl in the chest and she dropped down and she died on the floor. Now, according to the word of God, um, as a tree falls, so shall it lie. Ecclesiastes 11 and 3. So that girl died right there. And, you know, you can imagine them standing up, so, you know, it was crazy. But, hey, man. Hey, y'all be blessed tonight, man. Y'all have a good time, man. Y'all, y'all, y'all have fun, man. And remember, man, don't do anything I would do. Right. You can imagine that type of thing after you didn't hurt something like that. It's like, man, like, they convicted, like, standing there with the heels on and a nice new outfit. You know, it's like, man, I guess we're going to have to just go home and just pray or something. Find something to do. We're going to go to the movies. They would be convicted. And it wasn't that... You know, I looked at myself as being better than anybody or anything like that. It was just that, again, the Lord loved us so much that he was willing to make an investment in us. And he doesn't want the enemy to get the best of us in any area of our lives. So he'll sometimes send people your way. You think it might be a coincidence or a phone call or some type of warning that just warns you and lets you know, like, man, why did I hear that? Why did I turn on the radio and somebody just start talking about repent, judgment's coming? <laughs> and you just hear three words or something like, oh, Jesus. Now, like, man, let me turn this radio off. Well, you want a way to do some nonsense. You just heard three words, repent, judgment's coming. Or four words, and it's like, what? You know, and not realizing that the Lord loves us enough that he'll make, he's made an investment for a reason because he wants to see the greatness and greater things in us. So, Jesus says, I, you know, I pray that your faith doesn't fail, Peter. And the last one, he talks about Philippians uh, 3.19. Those things which you have heard, you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Jesus helped pre present, prevent some one from making the same mistakes. So Pete, uh, uh, Paul talks about here the same things which you have learned, the things that you have learned from me, the things that I have taught you, the things that you have come to Bible study after Bible study after Bible study, the things that you go to church and you hear, the same things that you've learned, the same things that you've received, the testimonies that people have given you how God has made a way time and time again, how God has encouraged somebody when somebody didn't have encouragement, the things that you've heard that you've seen God do, that you heard God do, and seen in me the things that I've given you as a testimony of what God has done in my life, 
do. The same things you do. It doesn't matter what, where you are, God wants to see you do the same things. Now, you may not be a preacher. You may not be an evangelist. You might not be a prophet. You may not call to be a pastor, but God has invested something in you. There, you may be a business person, and you may have a talent to where you can help people get businesses put together and helping people invest their money in wise things, and the church needs that, and there's people in church who may need help with their credit, or you may be good at interior design, or you may be good at something that helps somebody in some manner. God has given everybody something, and the best way for us to pay God back is just being able to be an investment in somebody else's life. The greatest investment that you could ever make in the life of somebody else is not money, it's not stocks, it's not bonds, it's not paying off your student loans, which would be a good thing. It's none of that stuff. It's taking the time to share the gospel with somebody who doesn't know Jesus. That's the greatest investment that you could ever make. Jesus was a chapter changer. He was a chapter changer. That people's chapter didn't end the way the devil wanted. He changed the chapters of people's lives every day just by investing time in those people. And uh, Paul says the same thing. The things you've learned, seen, and heard, I want you to do it. And the God of peace will be with you. He shall be with you. Jesus Christ. He gives you peace that surpasses all of the If you do these things, the God of peace will be with you. He will have your back. <clears throat> and the last scripture, and we're getting out of here. The last thing, Peter, my boy Peter, he goes down to Lydda, the city. And he goes down to the saints to encourage them and pray for them. And he comes upon a man who had been paralyzed for eight years. For eight years he had been paralyzed. And his name was Ananias. And he, he tells Ananias, and Peter said unto him, and he said, Ananias, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole, arise and make thy bed. And he arose immediately. And the Bible says that all that dwelt at Lydda and Saron saw him and turned to the Lord. That means that when everybody, when you study this text carefully, it meant that everybody in the entire region of Lydda and Sarah, which could have been hundreds, maybe thousands, when they saw that this man was healed from his infirmity, the entire region turned to the Lord. They gave them lives to the Lord by one man's deliverance. The fact that Peter took time to invest in this man's life changed the <laughs> lives and the chapters of an entire region forever. Showing how important it is and how influential that you can be. And it can be something that very well changes the lives of one or two people who go on to change the lives of maybe an entire city of people. And writes a new story about their lives. And it begins a new chapter in their life. One thing here in the last scripture I mentioned, the Bible says in the book of Daniel that as many souls that you turn to righteousness, you will shine as the stars of heaven. As many souls that you turn to righteous, the Lord said you will shine as the stars of the sky. Those that you take time to invest in, that you make an effort to, to minister to and say, hey, I just want to call you up, see how you're doing, so I'm praying for you. Whether it's friends, whether it's family, whether it's somebody who doesn't know Jesus, that you take the time to make an investment in somebody's life that changes them. Jesus said you're going to shine as the stars of the sky because you saw the real purpose of why you was put here on this journey called life. You saw that your most important thing to do while you was on this campus wasn't just going to class. It really wasn't getting an education. I didn't send you to go to school to get your education. You're going to do that while you're here. But your most important thing that you were put here to do was make an investment in somebody's life that would change the outcome of what their life could have been. You become now the hands, the feet, and the mouth of Jesus. And you become the chapter changer in somebody else's life. Albert Einstein once says, only a life only lived for others is a life worthwhile. Only a life lived for others is a life that's worthwhile. If you live your life for anything else other than for other people, then your life, you lose focus on what the real purpose and planning was for God putting here. So every day as we walk this walk, 
Even when we in a rush, we gotta study in last minute. I used to do it all the time, trying to get a paper done, trying to do other stuff, knowing good and well we should have got it done a long time ago. Why you got why you got all that to do when you sit in the library and you stress and you don't know how you're gonna get through this? Take time to set aside and say, Lord, you know, I know I got this paper due tomorrow, and I know I should have already done it. I know I got this exam tomorrow, and I know I should have already studied. But Lord, while I'm here at the library, Lord, if there's anybody you want me to impact, if there's anybody you want me to encourage. Like, Lord, give me a heart to go pray for somebody, go talk to somebody. And I can tell you countless times when I was in there studying political science, I'm working on that 20-page paper, and I am looking forward to doing it. I said, Lord, give me a heart to do something else. <laughs> While I'm sitting there, I ain't got a heart to do this paper. 20-page papers every quarter. Sometimes I had three 20-page papers. The Lord anointed me during that time to get them papers done. But while I was there at the library, countless times where God may just have me go up to somebody, like, how you doing? Just start talking to them about Jesus, or just start just encouraging. So I just want to come over and say how you doing. I so saw look like you were a little bit down. Just want to tell you to be encouraged. I don't know who you are, but just be encouraged. And you never know. You come back and that person's sitting there. You know they're crying or they're going through the. You never going through the. You never know how that what what you just said to them impacted their life because they might have been in a place where they're at no more options and they're like, man, don't nobody care about me. I don't feel like why am I doing this work? I want to give up. And the fact that you said, let me just put this paper aside for me. Let me just go encourage somebody. And I'm praying for you. You see somebody that you know ain't seen them in Bible study or church in a while, man. I ain't seen you in a while. Everything going okay? And here, you know, just take some time to talk to them for a couple minutes. Like, man, I'm going to keep you in prayer, man. Pray that God works everything out for you, man. You might have to pray for you. Pray for you. You may not know a lot of scriptures. You may not know a lot. I didn't know a lot when I came into the Bible study. But the Lord took me from where I was to where I am right now. I'm teaching a Bible study. I never saw myself eight years from now teaching Bible study. I was sitting in the seat, learning, taking notes, and now God has invested so much in me that now he says, I want you to go and be an investment in somebody else's life. So day by day, let us continue to just be an investment in somebody else's life. Amen? Amen. Any questions, comments, concerns? All right, cool. Yeah.